how can seller retain the title if the buyer doesn't do his role can he bring it back can he really you know uh, close in on his target and get his own things back sometimes it could be a tricky thing so we'll be focusing on that topic we call it the retention of the title ideally the seller should be able to get back the goods if the buyer is not willing to pay or buyer has failed to pay or buyer has gone bankrupt or something like that but it doesn't come that easy i have added a case though so you have to do further research with the support of the case in order to get a clearer understanding of the topic so um, i've uh, covered up a big number of cases in this particular video to, so that uh, any viewer can get a decent understanding of the topic all right so i mean the whole story came up with this particular so called the roma park close case um we'll discuss a case later but check the fact first what does it say the buyer doesn't get to own the product until it's paid in full so normally when we sell a product it's not unnatural for the seller to include a term we call it a close in the contract telling you're not the owner until you pay it in full then i can have the right to obtain the goods back so uh, we call it the retention of title clause some people call it the rot clause it's pretty normal in a contract right so that's what the court said you know i mean this particular case so it resulted in what you call as a romal park clause that's how the case the entire clause became famous as well um yeah take a look at the base of the case yeah a limited bought yeah it's aluminium foil on credit of course to pay later so uh that was the uh deal and b after buying the foil uh, sold it to a third part that's also not unnatural right you know you buy sometimes to for the purpose of making products and selling it to third parties so passing it to the third parties but later b goes into liquidation now what happens b has to pay money to a for the foils bought because he bought it on credit then a uh, files legal action claiming payments from b and a also claims payment from sales to the third part that means now uh, you know b has some uh, of the stuff left but some of it has already gone to a third part so b wanted money uh, that um i'm sorry yeah a wanted the money that b collected from the third parties also not just the goods return uh you know as well as the money payments so what did the court say the judgment yeah he can have the payment ownership only after full payment so true b has passed some of the goods to third party let's call it c but that money too the value of it belongs to a a has a full ownership now the products may not be there but the payments from that a has a right to claim so that's a, uh, the story of this particular case aluminium industry person is a german case uh, you know it has become pretty famous right uh, as a case of the romal park clause it was heard in 1976 but ever since then this issue has uh, been uh, at the head of so many cases take a look at this case ribbon work limited the 1980 case a recent case right is a case of selling of fiber to b and b makes carpets out of that so uh, now uh, later what happens we replace any contract which by way of security for the payment of debt confers an interest in property defeasible or destructible on payment of such debt or appropriate such property for the discharge of the debt must necessarily be regarded as ceasing a mortgage or charge so what happens here now uh, you know a sells fiber to b now b has bought it on credit but uh, b converts the fiber and make carpets out of it now can a claim the fiber back now b doesn't have the fiber anymore he has already converted it now what Take a look at the second part of the paragraph. The contract between them gives a beneficial equitable ownership to finished products. Yes. Now, fiber is no longer there, but the carpets made 
with the support of the with, with the addition of the fiber that it has an ownership beneficial and equitable fair enough ownership we call it right so be free to sell the products yeah it yeah. can't stop you from keeping the products because now it's no longer the fiber right if b had only fiber left yeah it could have claimed it back but now b b has converted it to something else but here yeah a could only you know uh, have an equitable ownership and allow b to sell and recover money that b has collected from the sales so i mean uh, in in sale of goods remedies you know there are several number of remedies that the seller can have he can uh, you know reclaim the possession of the goods he can recall the goods uh, he could resell the goods these kind of things he could do but uh, that's for general products they are you know i buy a car from you and i don't get the chance to pay you back and you can come back and recover the car but what if i buy something from you and i convert it to something else now what can you do this is what uh, the entire romal park clause is all about you could um, claim a right over the property without claiming the property and you can allow the sale of the property to happen in this case carpet and claim the money from me we call it the equitable ownership take a look at this it's a case on john right focus on the cases uh, i've added up the age uh, year of the case and everything so that it would make it easier for you to do further research please do that and when it comes to a case the year included matters a lot because there may be similar named cases a supplies yarn to b a textile manufacturer so b is a textile manufacturer so he gets yarn from b he also right uh, b would have recovered uh, sorry you know b would have converted the yarn to something else retention of title clause in contract gives right to a to recover yarn if payments are not made yes if the yarn was still there yes he can recover them but if it has been converted into something well we get uh, we need to pay back money only not the product there's no way to give the product back right because he has converted it take a look at it the ownership of the material shall remain with the seller yes which reserves the right to dispose the material until payment in full for all the material has been received by it in accordance with the terms of the contract through that but can a demand recovery for the finished product now that would be a problem because it's no longer yarn so a cannot take that back all a can do is you know allow b to sell it and let b make money out of it and claim his equitable right yeah fair enough price from the finished product court gives a the right to recover unused yarn if there is there yes he can claim it back but not the finished stuff because good should be identifiable as contract then yes you can recover it but if the good has been converted into something else then it's not the good that you gave him right so there you have to uh, claim only payments next case uh, property that ceases to exist it's a similar line right take a look at this look at the pictures so i buy resin from you out of that i made uh, what you call chipboards you could you would have seen right that you, you use this chipboard for the partitions and all made out of resin so i am the resin seller i uh, let you convert my use my resin to convert uh, that resin into chipboards right use them to make rich chipboards and you get it from i mean, you get it from me for credit you know my resin so can i what can i do can i recover the chipboards from you Gordon UK Limited versus Scottish Timber Products, 1981 case, recent one. Supply of resin to make chipboards A to B. Yeah, again there was a retention of title clause in the contract, but you can't claim the product because this is not the product that I gave you. It's a product made out of what I gave you. Yeah, so B can have full ownership to the uh, the the chipboards only after he paid uh, the full for the resin. but a can't claim the chip boards because you know then that's not some, the stuff that a gave me right irreversible change has been done so a can only demand payments that's it then only the proceeds take a look at it yeah pitch dart limited 1984 case reference 
supply of leather to make bags, A to B. Similar story, right? Again, there was a retention of title clause. It's very standard for a contract to have it. That means if you don't pay back, I can claim the goods. Well, you can see in some of these cases, right? It cannot happen that way. If the good has been converted to something else, like here, I give you leather, you make bags out of it. Now what? Now you, uh, you got the leather from me on credit. Now you have not paid the full payment for the, for the leather I gave you, but I can't recover the goods because I don't have the goods now uh, in your hand, right? You're converting to bags. Can I recover the bags from you? Answer is no. But do you have the full ownership to the bags? For that also, the answer is no, because we haven't paid in full. My only right is, yeah, claim money from the bags, sale of the bags. So what I have is a charge over the product. I cannot own the charge, sorry, own the product because it's no longer, I mean, leather. It's bags converted out of leather. So I can only have a legal right, we call it a charge over the finished product. That means, okay, you might use uh, from the sale of the particular product. So I can't stop the sale of the bags, right? I have to let you have the sale of the bags. I can only claim money uh, from you for the sales. Reversible, what is that? Hindi Lennox yeah, versus Graham Puttick, 1984 case. Diesel engines, now this is interesting. I sell you diesel engines and you make generators out of that with the use of my diesel engine and some other products. Now again, yeah, uh, you fail to pay me. Now, can I recover the diesel engine? Answer is yes, because diesel engine is something that's fixed to the generator. So I have the right to ask you to so unscrew them and claim the diesel engines back. It's not like the case of, uh, you know, I mean, a leather converted into bags. I can't ask you to convert that back into leather if you don't pay me. So there I can only demand money. But in this case, you don't pay me. I can claim the diesel engines back even if the diesel engines are fixed to the new generators. It's reversible, right? Not irreversible. Yeah, all money is closed. That means, okay, full payment of money. This is Armour right? It's a German case, 1991. You know, when it comes to sale of goods, it's technically a universal law. So courts learn from, you know, the decisions made in other jurisdictions. That's a reality. And it's very similar to Sri Lanka as well. There are so many instances that Sri Lankan courts utilized foreign cases. It's almost a standard in everywhere in the world. So supply was steel, A to B, and there was a retention of title close in the contract. That means you don't pay me, I need the steel back. All goods delivered by us remain our property until all debts owed to us, including any balances exist, existing at relevant times are settled. So this is quoted from the contract itself. I've done a few times so that you can understand the language of the contract, right? Contract came under German law, but the delivery of goods in Scotland. All right, remember that. So two jurisdictions. B, that means the one who bought the, one who bought the seal on credit, right? All these are the contracts made on credit, right? With the promise of payment later. B defended himself challenging retention of title doesn't come on Scottish law. So what he said was right, okay, the deal was done in German law. This is Scotland. So I don't have to, you know, follow a contract made in Germany. And also by that time, the steel were cut into smaller strips. So no longer you can claim steel as it was. And this was in a different legal jurisdiction also. So B, the defendant was telling, I don't have to pay back. You cannot recover the product from me. What did the court say? Now, it's a Scottish court, remember that. Court was simple, right? You have no right to the good until and unless you have fully paid for the goods. Oh, yes, now the other party cannot recover the goods. The steel is no longer there, but you have to fully pay for the goods. So, even if the jurisdiction changes, right, a buyer cannot escape his commitment to pay. That's the thing. Yeah. F.G. Wilson Engineer Limited versus John Walt, right? 2013, pretty close enough case. So out here, it was kind of a, uh, yeah, supply of generators A to B, right? 
Um, you may not see some of the corners, right? I'll read out to you, right? Buyer shall not apply any set off to the price of seller's products without prior written agreements by the seller, right? That means what? If I sell product to you, and if you're going to sell that product to someone else, you can't put additional price for that product without my permission. You're technically like my agent, right? They say, I sell generators to you, so you can sell those generators to someone else. That's the idea. But uh, any additional price you're going to put for that, I also need to know. Right? You can't technically buy things on credit from me for 10 and you cannot sell them to someone else for 15. I should, I need to know because you bought it from me for credit. That's it, right? The type, because you have no title to put a higher price. That's the thing. Imagine that you buy, uh, imagine you say you buy books from me, right? Um, kind of, um, can I uh, sort of uh, edit this and uh, give a mini try to edit it so that I can uh, you know, make it look uh, darker. So while it being uh, there, shall I kind of uh, keep talking? You know, imagine that I uh, sort of sell, uh, you know, something like, let's say files to you. Oh, one file, 50 rupees, cardboard files. I sell them to you for credit. So what I do is uh, I, I sell them, uh, you know, uh, as credit to you. Can you, uh, so then who are the owner of the particular product? I'm the owner of the particular product, right? So can you uh, sort of uh, sell them to someone else at a higher price than the price that I gave you? Yes, you can, but I have the right to know the price. Why do I have the right to know the price? Because you took it, took the files from me for credit. So I'm still the owner. So I have the right to know your sales price, right? You don't have the title yet. So whatever you do to the goods at what price you sell, I need to know. Then who are you here? The court think that you are just an agent of mine, like because you haven't fully paid for it and you're selling my product to someone else. So you're just an agent for court, for law. So if you are transferring my goods taken on credit from me, right? To someone else, how you sell it, at what price you sell, what time, what terms you are going to set for that, I need to know all that. That's a law. Title shall not pass to the buyer unless seller has received payment in full. Prior to title passing, buyer shall be entitled to resell and shall count to the seller for the proceeds. Everything. That's the thing. So, then uh, let's take a look at the rules. So these are sale of goods rules. Mm. You know, I mean, in the sale of goods, uh, there are quite a few rules with regard to uh, with, with regard to the duty of the seller, right? Take a look at it. The unconditioned contract for the sale of specific goods, right? Deliverable state, yeah. So, um, you know, if the seller has put the goods uh, into a deliverable state, and if the buyer has uh, identified them as a right good, imagine a cake. Okay, these are sale of goods. Act rules, right? So you order a cake from me. I do the cake for you. You're happy with the cake. That's it. Now you have a duty to buy. Right? You can't escape from uh, that duty. What's the rule two? Imagine something like a bangle, right? So I am the uh, goldsmith, the jewelry maker. You're the one who ordered the bangles from me. I have a, a manufacturer. I have made the bangles, uh, designed the bangles and all that. Now... Uh, once I have done it, I have the right to show it to you. And if you are happy with the bangle, and then I have the right to weigh it and to measure it to figure out the price. Right? So, uh, where there is a contract for the seller specific goods, and the seller is bound to do something to the goods for the purpose of putting them into deliverable state, the property does not pass until the thing is done and the buyer has noticed that it has been done. So, I give you the notice and you are happy about it, right? And I have the right to measure it, weigh it, then only, yeah. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, you have the right to purchase the things, as I told you, right? 
After finishing it, I have the right to weigh and measure it and all that. I can set the price. So some of you may have that experience, right? When you order a bangle, they may say 50,000 rupees. But once a bangle is finished, right? When they weigh it, it could be a little bit more or even less, right? I have the right at the last moment to ascertain the exact price, right? So you order it from me, I do it. Then you are happy with the design and my finish is all right. So you consider it to be right at the state that you can buy. But now I have the right to measure it and to determine the final price. That's a fourth rule. Now, when goods are delivered, to imagine buying a shirt from a shop. Now, uh, when you buy a shirt from the shop, is it in a deliverable state? Can you specify the shirt? No, you have to wear it to see and you have to check the seams and everything. You can't do that in a shop. Right? Anyway, the men's shirts are pretty much packed up, right? Uh, and, you know, on the box, plastics and clips and cardboards and everything, right? There's no way you can check it up. You bring it back home. So, do you have a sale of goods contract at home? Sorry, in the shop? No. What you have is a contract only. After you come home, bring it home. After you test it, wear it, check it out. If you are happy with it, then yes, you have a contract. What do you do? Do you go back to the shop and say, uh, okay, shirt is all right, I'm happy? No, you don't do that, right? You don't go there. If you're happy, uh, you don't have any complaints. And if you don't give a complaint within a reasonable time, okay, uh, the shop will consider that, okay, you have accepted the shirt. If you have a problem with the shirt, yeah, you have a duty to return the shirt within a reasonable time. Of course, this is not within three days or seven days, right? You can take more than that. This three-day rule or the seven-day rule set by our I mean, the clothing shops are their laws, not the country's law or the sale of goods law. You can give it to them later. Right? And demand the cash back. Now take a look at the writing. When goods are delivered to the buyer on approval or no sale or return or other similar terms, the property in the goods passes to the buyer. How? Imagine the shirt, right? When he signifies his approval or acceptance, that means okay, I call the uh, seller and say I'm happy with the shirt. Let's say I get, uh, you know, I mean, a blazer and a trouser or coat uh, done by, you know, Linton or something, right? The tailors, comedians. So they do the fitons and all that. But still, I can uh, bring it home. And then if I'm fully all right with it, right? Because it's a larger value contract now. Uh, all of it may cost a lot. So they, either they may call me to ask whether I'm happy with it. Or I may call back and say, all right, I'm happy with it. Then sell a goods contract now. Until I am fully satisfied with the item I buy, there is no sale of goods contract. Of course, if he does not uh, give notice of uh, rejection within a reasonable time, then yes, contract is considered to have been done. Right? I have a duty to tell them within a reasonable time. What's this reasonable time? How long is it? Well, it's uh, up to case by case basis. Now take a look at this. Now, let's imagine, uh, you know, pile of sands, you order a big pile of sand, a lorry load of sand from someone else. Is it a sale of goods contract or a contract? Think about it. Do you get to check every grain of sand when you buy? Do you get to, you know, dig up the deeper and see whether the sand is good or bad? You just order sand to be delivered, right? One cube of sand and then the, then the delivery truck or the owner of uh, the load, right, will just dump it on your yard after bringing it here. After that only we'll see whether the content is uh, real sand or stones or whatever, right? Read out place now. Where there's a contract for the sale of unascertained or future goods. So you really can't identify the sand, right? You just order. That's it. And the goods of that description are in a deliverable state. Yeah, looks to be sand. But I can't identify whether they are the real sand that I want, right? And unconditionally appropriated to the contract. Yeah, I simply say, send me a sand load. That's all. There are not uh, types and shapes and the gauges and the uh, different, different types of sand. Uh, you know, just sand. Either by seller or with the ascent of the buyer or by the buyer with the ascent of the seller. Yeah, so either way, right? The property in the goods shall passes to the buyer. And the asset may be expressed or implied and may be given either before or after the provision. Yeah, that's it. So when I order the load of sand and there's no way for me to ascertain it, right? 
and uh, that's it. They will deliver the sign to me. And that's the standard. So, uh, you know, it's considered the contract done, right? And after the sand has been delivered, and if I'm unhappy about the quality of the sand, if it's poor quality or if it's, uh, you know, if it's mud or whatever, right? In, in, in a special case, yes, I can reject. Otherwise, I'm considered to have accepted it. That's the thing. Take a look at the pizza delivery. You order pizza on call, right? Uh, online. And you basically tell a type or a particular, particular brand of pizza and the delivery man comes. And that's not exactly the pizza you ordered, something else. Not the size, something else. Oh, too cold, not hot enough. Or has been damaged in the delivery. Now what? Take a look at number two. Where in persons of the contract, the seller delivers a good to the buyer or to a courier and other bailey or custodian with a name by the buyer or not for the purpose of the transition to the buyer and does not reserve the right to disposal, he is to be taken to have unconditionally appropriated the goods of the contract. That is there. If I ask Pizza Hut to, or some other hut to deliver the goods to me, now, um, uh, you know, maybe let's say take something like Uber or Pick Me or something, right? I am considered to have taken responsibility for it. Let's say the Uber bike gets into an accident and the foot is damaged. I can't claim money from Pizza Hut or, you know, the food joint for that. Imagine that. Imagine the Uber guy when delivering the food, uh, uh, the scooter, the, they get caught in a rain and the food is destroyed. I can't claim money from uh, the delivery shop. Because I am responsible for the delivery also. But if the particular delivery is done by the uh, delivery shop itself, like the Pizza Hut scooter. Yeah, if something happens, yes, I can take action against, uh, uh, you know, the delivery shop itself because the delivery was done by them. Got it? Yeah, that's the thing. Of course, I may take action against the Uber or Pizza Hut if they have done a wrong, del wrong delivery for me. But definitely, I have no right to claim the food again from the shop that delivered the goods to me. Remember that, right? Okay, that's the fifth rule. So uh, these are sale of goods rules. Uh, you know, we can focus on that. It will be important. So a few, two, two few cases of importance. Just few things, right? Blue Monkey Gaming Limited versus Hudson and others. It's the seller's right to prove the retention or title clause, not to the other party. Right? That's it. So if you have a retention or title clause in a contract, okay, then... Uh, that you have set a retention or title clause and it is this strong or that strong. It's up to the seller to prove that, not to the buyer. That's all. Yeah. Forsyth International Limited versus Silver Shipping, 1994 case, supply of fuel A to B. Right? Now, this will be interesting. Take a look at it now. I imagine that I am A, you are B. Okay. I supply oil to you. Right uh, now, I supply the oil, um, you know, to the ship ordered by you. Okay. Now, I mean, let's make it simple. Let's say I supply. Uh, imagine uh, uh, a load of bricks to a lorry sent by you. So now, a load of bricks has been loaded into the lorry, and the lorry is, uh, yeah, to be delivered to you. But you have been unable to pay money to the lorry for the transportation. So what does the lorry person does? He confiscates the goods on board the lorry, telling, if you don't give me the money, I can't hand over the goods to you. He says, can he do that? So why is the lorry person doing it? Because you failed to pay for the lorry. And you've taken the goods on credit from me, right? So you ordered a load of bricks, let's say 1,000 bricks from me with the promise to pay later. You asked the lorry to come to my place and take the bricks to be taken to your place. But uh, you have failed to pay the lorry owner also. Now the lorry owner is keeping the goods with him, telling until you pay. Who is you? You, right? Pay the lorry guy, that means lorry owner. He will not 
deliver the uh, you know uh, bricks to you can the lorry owner do that answer is no why not the bricks inside the lorry still belong to me because i haven't yet got the cash for that from you so i am the owner lorry owner cannot confiscate that he can't do that right i can recover the you know the goods from uh, the lorry owner because they belong to me the ownership hasn't passed to you because you are yet to pay me so in this particular case the same thing happened right so it was an oil laden ship full of petroleum and i have Uh, sold that entire tanker load of oil to you on credit but you have not paid for the tanker so what did the tanker company do under a charter party agreement just uh, you know repossess the ship with the goods so then i took legal action okay the problem between the tanker and me is something else but the full load belongs to me still because i am yet to get the payment for the full from you court said yes i that cannot be repossessed by anyone else because the owner is still me okay so that's that uh, the topic here has been to discuss a very i mean pretty interesting topic and a rather hard topic in questions and even in practical life right how far can we retain the title to the goods in the event of non payment how much can we retain it so how how close can we hit it right in our dart hope uh, you had an understanding of it and uh, okay catch you in another lesson